started off, I <laughs> moved up to the top job and became the course leader. Soon to be followed by Kirsty, <laughs> down here on the left, <laughs> hopefully a couple of years' time. And that's about it, I think. Yeah, Gaelic and English speaker all my life. I didn't learn Gaelic or English as such as an adult, but uh, I had a go at learning French and German at various stages and a bit of Welsh. Kirsty. Hi, it's Mr. Kirsty. Um, I'm Kirsty McDougall. I'm a teacher on the Curse of Comish on uh, our first year immersion course. I also teach on Galicus Connell today, um, the course for the fluent speakers. Um, I am from Burnisdale in the north end of Sky, and I did my degree in Gaelic and politics at Aberdeen and then later masters in Edinburgh. And I'm back happily at home teaching at the Lord. And yourself, Joy. Um, Kuka Magave, wish you joy. Um, so I'm Joy Dunlop. I'm from just outside Open originally. I am not a, a native Gaelic speaker. I didn't start learning Gaelic properly till I went to secondary school. And I did my learners higher there in my fifth year. Went up to Solmore initially for one year. Um, in my in my sixth year and they basically just kept bribing me to stay for another year by offering fun things that I could do and I ended up doing the Canon Ex Culture in Gaelic, the Gaelic Language and Culture degree for four years at Solmore and really since then I've been working mostly in, in Gaelic in different, different jobs and yeah that's about it. Joy and next we have Chriselle. I'm Chriselle. Uh, like Marachug, I grew up in Lewis, um, just outside the main town of Stornoway, and I now live in Stornoway. Um, I, like Joy, didn't uh, go to Gaelic Museum <coughs> Education. I just basically started learning it when I went to secondary school, did uh, higher and fifth year, and then on to advanced higher and sixth year. Um, knew I wanted to work in Gaelic, uh, to be honest, it was all I was ever really good at at school. Um, and I really wanted to work in the Gaelic media industry. Um, so more have a course in uh, course TV and basically I wasn't fluent enough to kind of uh, jump onto that course straight away. But I did also want to gain a bit more confidence in speaking, uh, reading and writing the language. So that led me going to in course um, That course was also offered here in Lewis, but fancied a wee change going from one island to another. And definitely one of the best things I did for myself now in my career. So, yeah, that's about me. Thanks everyone. Um, we thought it would be just interesting to start with a poll and find out who here has ever been to Slate. Um, we're going to do a bit of a and a in a wee while, so it'll be interesting if, if any of you haven't been to Slate before, then we can tell you a bit about it. Don't know if you can see the results there. We also are live streaming on YouTube, so we won't have everyone's answers, but um, there's quite a few of you who've never been before. So uh, we'll be able to enlighten you about the joys of living in Slate, which is great fun. Um, I think um, we'll go to Murahu just now, who's going to tell us a wee bit about the course. Hi, well, OK, well, the course in Course of Comish is a uh, kind of a... It's, you know, it's got two aspects to the course, really. It's a straightforward language course um, for intermediate uh, level speak, Gaelic speakers, Gaelic learners. And um, you can think of it as a course, um, as, as the kind of course you would do in high school or in, um, in a, you know, in a, in a night classes or whatever. But um, what was I going to say? Um, in the strategic sense and in the institutional sense, from the college's point of view, it's the first year course which equips uh, uh, learners or uh, students with the kind of, um, develops your fluency to the point where by the end of the year, you could join the main uh, second year of the degree and continue with, you, with your degree, stand shoulder to shoulder with your fluent speaking counterparts who will have come through the other stream. And uh, that's where it sits in the, in the sort of the university scheme 
So from that point of view, uh, you, uh, would, you don't start as a beginner at the beginning of the course. Um, you come in as an intermediate and I could talk later on about, you know, the details about how to find out whether you're ready for the course and what the process of applying is. And the course itself, um, you know, um, well, it's a bit like a language course that you would have had in school, except that you're doing it all day, every day. So imagine if you had all day, every day in high school to do one subject. Imagine how good you'd be at it by the end of uh, a year or two. So that's what we do here. And um, we do Gal uh, we teach Gaelic all day, every day, sort of nine to three thirty, four o'clock, half nine to, to four o'clock, stopping now and then for a tea and lunch and so on. But kind of like a friendly boot camp, really. Um, you're at it all day. <laughs> Um, I might be bringing bad flashbacks here for Joy and Chrisella. I hope I'm not. Um, <laughs> um, uh, six modules to fit into the uh, UHI general degree template, six modules. But from the, the student's point of view, it's generally doing Gaelic all day. Um, a foundation course in that sense, um, primarily language learning. In semester, the language settings maybe in semester one are a bit more to do maybe with uh, um what you'd call sort of informal settings, just um, simple uh, everyday Gaelic to illustrate the, the grammar structures we're looking at. Maybe in semester two, we, we maybe have slightly more academic settings, perhaps go up a, a level. And the preparatory work that's done in semester one, in semester two, we, we're looking at more perhaps higher registers, higher register language structures. And accordingly, we kind of move to more, perhaps more... Um, Things like history and stuff like that to illustrate uh, to illustrate the structure, so on. But uh, primarily, it's um, an incremental grammat grammatical course from September to May, in which we look at basically don't leave any stone unturned in the the basic infrastructure of the Gaelic language, the bones of the language, uh, all all the shapes of the verb throws, all the verb tenses, uh, um, the the personal and the impersonal voice, and so on. Everything you would expect in a language course. Um, we infuse that with a lot and a lot of idiom. Half the classes will be grammar classes. The other half of the classes, uh, there are a team of about four of us, uh, maybe four or five of us throughout the year. And um, about half of it is straight grammar classes. But even in the grammar classes, we incorporate idiom in the sense that we're doing communication exercises all day. And uh, we sort of incorporate quite a lot of um, speech and idiom into that as well. It's not just... Um, throwing verb shapes around all day and um, we kind of turn it into like a conversation as well so that there's some um, oh, well maybe it's, maybe it's too hard to describe really but um i think uh, overall over over the course of a year in the straightforward language aspect of it like what's presented by by the course and um, you, you you gain a you gain a kind of grammatical literacy if you like and also we kind of fill the bones of the language and we kind of put the flesh on the bones with a lot of idiom as much as we can squeeze in to the content of any day. So that's the, the straightforward, I suppose the USP from that point of view would be that we have 20 hours a week roughly in the classroom. That's a long time to be working on one subject. So a lot of time spent on it, far more than um, the, could, the high school could offer or anybody else. So that's, what, that's I suppose, a... a USP in that sense, but what the course is really, so what, what's the outcome of, of that? Well, um, grammatical and orthographic literacy, you're, you're able to, to read, write, and uh, um, use the language in an increasingly um, high register as, as you get to the end of the year. You produce work, for example, for your final assessments, which will be along the lines of presenting a, a script for a news program on TV or radio, for example. And, and presenting a project um, which was historical, maybe uh, looking at a, a, an area study or that kind of thing. So you're using, you're getting towards academic levels of speech then. So that's that side of it. But really what the course is really about um, is, is it's a sort of the other strand of the course, if you like, is uh, it's almost a social experiment. Um, the, the USP of this course really, really is that uh, it's it's uh, we use no English at all in the in the tuition, and we don't use English in the classroom. English has no place uh, in the course experience, and um, that's obviously fortified by the the college itself and the fact that it's a Gaelic language college in business in, in all the business language and the the operational language of the college is Gaelic, and we are a microcosm of that within the, the, our classroom. Um, we use no English. The tutor uses no English in the instruction. 
you use no English in the collaboration, as you said about the, the sort of the language tasks and the collaborative exercises throughout the day. Um, we don't use English in incidental speech to say hello, cheerio, and to welcome each other in the morning, to, to catch each other's news and so on. We, we don't use English in any of that. So you're um, sort of acquire, uh, you're using the language, the Gaelic that you have to acquire more of it in the process of acquiring more of it. And um, we treat you as a Gaelic speaker the moment you walk in the door and um, you present yourself accordingly. You, you become pre-fit for this course. It's not an unfamiliar act for you to be a Gaelic speaker, low level, perhaps, um, if your Gaelic is uh, altogether too good, well, you go to the other course anyway. But um, it's not an un it's not for beginners and it's not for people who, have, who belong only to the world of uh, worksheets and classes and talking to the teacher, talking Gaelic only when the teacher talks to you. When I was in high school and we did French, um, the teacher would, the French teacher would come in every morning and uh, for a moment every day, it was uh, a purely French speaking experience. She would say, bonjour la classe. We'd all say, bonjour madame. And then from that minute on, everything we did seemed to be through English, through the prism of English, exploring aspects of French. And Murder, would you speak to Roderick now? And could you ask him these 10 questions? And he'll ask you those 10 questions back. And um, we were sort of performing little acts of French, like a performance act, like a dancer on the stage. Rather than we never seem to be using our French to sort of present ourselves or our own personality. And that's where we differ. Um, so you're a Gaelic speaker. Um, you, acqu you acquire, you use as much Gaelic as you have to acquire more of it. It's like turning up in a way. It's like turning up um, to the workplace. And we form a community in the classroom, which is entirely Gaelic speaking. You use what you have of it. Um, you could be, in a sense, be turning up to um, a factory or a shop and doing your job of work with other people throughout the day and um, putting sardines in tins or making components for the motor industry. We just so, ha so happens that what our job is, is to acquire, is to study aspects of, for example, Gaelic grammar or look at literature extracts or um, listen to recordings or whatever. And uh, all the language we use in, in interacting with one another and carrying out all of that is Gaelic. And that's what the course is really about. So that covertly or um, overtly, <laughs> you're sort of you are, are carrying out a social experiment in which you're the subject and uh, you're turning yourself into a Gaelic speaker, really. Um, Gaelic is not an unfamiliar act. And the more you have of it when you come in, the better, of course. But pretty soon it's it, it's the norm. We, we we talk Gaelic all day and gradually you go through this inter interesting transition uh, in the course of the year. You may not be there the day it starts, but by the end of the eight months, uh, you think of yourself as a Gaelic speaker who can present your personality to hopefully a large extent in the new language. You may not still be the best, you may not be that interested in grammar and you might not like that aspect, the linguistic aspect of language learning, but you will still be a Gaelic speaker. And if you do like the linguistics and all the rest of it, you'll continue and go to year two of the degree and year three and so on. And um, you'll do all of that and you'll fulfill your ambitions uh, academically. But um, Crucially, uh, you might also leave with an exit award and decide that it was a one-year course anyway. Throughout this course, the 23 years that it's been running now, um, by far the majority of the entrants to the course have been interested in doing it as a one-year standalone option. In that sense, we're not that good at producing um, students for years two, three and four of the degree, I have to say, because people have chosen uh, this uh, course as a one-year standalone thing, which increases, um, uh, develops their own fluency to the point where they like it. Quite often it's people on a career break uh, who will who'll, um, who maybe return to the place of work and maybe take a new remit with a, with a Gaelic aspect to it. Maybe teachers who will want to transfer to the Gaelic medium side, people in other kinds of jobs and tour guides, that kind of thing. Sometimes it's students on, in the middle of a degree in another institution who will come between years two and three before they start doing their thesis and all that sort of thing. And... Um, They'll, uh, they'll do this kind of treated as a booster course, um, much as a, a say a French or a German or a Spanish language student in university would go to Spain, France, or Germany for a year and be a language assistant in a school or something. We're kind of the year abroad <laughs> for some other um, higher education institutions in Scotland and so on. So it's um, it's that aspect of the course that's the most interesting thing about it, and of course it's that aspect of the course too for which you have to be best prepared. Um, 
you have to get yourself ready for the course. I can talk about that a little bit later if if that comes up in the conversation. How how to apply and how do you know whether it's the course for you? Um, basically, you would get into this course much as you would get into a drama course or an art school or a music uh, college uh, by an audition, essentially, and uh, which takes the form of a simple, the ability to hold a simple conversation with me or one of us, um, uh, maybe over the phone or on Skype or whatever, and, and Zoom or whatever, and uh, your ability to kind of a evidence of language use, if you like, and your ability to hold a simple conversation for 5, 10, 15 minutes and uh, to, to show you a kind of match fit, if you like, for entry at the threshold level, because uh, being a course which produces students for second year and for the uh, to, to go into second year as a fully fledged um, Gaelic medium university student, you can't we can't start at zero, obviously. And I can talk later on, if you like, about um, the courses that we offer that could bring you to the threshold level. So, but that's the character of the course kind of summed up there. I'm trying to think what I haven't said. It, it was, Gaelic is in the, if you like, in the product. You become, um, you develop your fluency to a considerable degree. And it's in the, it's in the process. It's what we do all day. And um, it's, you're in the moment. Um, not only the fact that you're having to produce speech all day, speech centered, obviously, as you can probably tell. And not only that, but you don't come in with work you've prepared particularly. You don't really know before you turn up in the morning what's going to be on the menu that day or what the worksheets are going to be. And you're in the moment in dealing with the material that's presented to you. So it's in every sense, it, it replicates almost, if you like, um, the conditions that you were offered in your first language. Um, when you started speaking your first language, be it English or whichever language it was, uh, you were in that environment in which you needed to, to speak, to learn to speak, to survive, uh, to communicate and to improve your position. Uh, at two years, old, two years of age, you start saying things and then you gradually, um, the sophistication of your speech improves and you start uh, operating and interacting with the people around you in the social space. And if you think about that being the process of your first language, we kind of create those conditions in an adult context, in a university academic context in one sense, but we're recreating the conditions in which you learned your first language. And that's what makes it really, really interesting for yourself. Of course, you do it all. We, we put it all on the plate for you, but you have to sort of eat it. <laughs> you have to um, uh, kind of meet the challenge halfway. And in the context of the language classroom, it's Gaelic, you know, it's an enclosed Gaelic space entirely. Like I said earlier, we don't use English in any aspect of the communication uh, throughout the day. Then you have to think of the college environment, the wider college environment, a Gaelic language, a dedicated Gaelic language college, whose students, notionally at least, have all come for the same reason, to develop their language skills. So you have a ready-made Gaelic community in the, in the microcosmic sense, in the classroom, and in a wider sense, in the whole college community. And then what do we do all day um, in any language? Well, we wake up in the morning and we start communicating with uh, people in our environment. So it's a, it's a core human activity that you're learning to do here in the slightly strange setting of an academic setting. But all you're really doing is relearning what you did uh, with your first language. And in that sense, the college environment, all the people who populate it and um, uh, everything you'll do from one, one end of the day to the other, you have the option consensually to speak the language you're learning, as it were. And that's where the eventually the definition gets blurred between am I a language learner or am I a language speaker? And by the end of the year, one way or another, uh, you're you're starting to, I don't know, can, can I use this, the term self-identify? Or has that been linked to other subjects these days? But you're beginning to identify as a Gaelic speaker and you, you consider yourself a Gaelic speaker. And that's the sort of um, language is your currency. Yeah. Um, you, you learn, like your first language, according to your need to use it. I mean, you, you learn a certain, we work in the classroom and 20 hours, a, 20 hours a week sounds a lot to be spending on any one subject. But when it's a core human practical skill like speech, it's the 100 hours, 100 waking hours you spend outside the classroom in the social space that determines what gives you the theatre in which to develop, of course, the craft and also determines whether you'll be a fully-fledged Gaelic speaker, uh, comfortable in your skin, easy in your skin, 
or whether you're still sort of restricting yourself. You know, so that there's a certain um, there are you know there's a certain reserve about people. It's a tough thing to do. You're kind of having to perform a performance type skill which you're not yet good at. And we can be inhibited in those situations, all of us. I mean, if you ask me to start juggling now, I wouldn't be keen. <laughs> if I'm still, if I can, I'm still learning how to do it, you know, which I'm not. But um, if I were, I would be. I wouldn't be that keen to do it in front of a lot of people. So, in that sense, that there, there are the inhibitions, but it's the extent to which a student can overcome those um, natural inhibitions and uh, have a bedrock of confidence to go on and kind of understand that everybody else is in the same boat and. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's almost an artificial route to performing the most natural act, which is speech. It's a strange and interesting kind of course. And I, I say that I quite often think that um, you accidentally become a sociolinguist in the process because you sort of, you, you, your own case study over the months of the course. And you're like, I'm watching somebody here sort of transitioning into a speaker of another language. And I'm, I'm there, you know, I'm the one, I'm the, I'm the case study, you know, and it's, so that's the, I, that's a kind of the holistic, um, description of the course and um, the more practical um, details we can get onto later if anybody's interested about what are the modules and you know um, times and how to apply and that kind of thing but maybe I've said enough now and um, I can let Joy and maybe Chriselle and, and Kirsty respond to those impressions maybe yeah. <clears throat> I, was I don't know if I went over my five minutes Ellen did I what was that 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> I was given oh, okay. five but, but we're used, Kirsty and I are used to speaking for an hour and a quarter. That's a class, <laughs> the length of a class. So, um, yeah, I probably went over the five. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, and I think. Um, Joy, I was interested to hear when you said at the beginning that did you originally plan to come to Fulmore for a year? Yeah. Um, and were you were planning to do the course of Comish and then go, go off somewhere else. Could you tell us a bit about how you changed your mind and? What a great year you had. <laughs> yeah, um, so originally I wasn't really sure exactly what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to do medicine. That was my plan. And um, really there wasn't anything that I, I wanted to do the way the columns worked out um, for my sixth year in school. And um, so instead of staying in school for a year doing stuff I didn't want to do, um, I'd actually been up at Solomon Ostig uh, during summer for doing kind of step dancing courses and and courses that weren't Gaelic courses doing music courses so I knew the place anyway and I thought oh, I'll, I'll go up there for the year I'm not I guess ruining um, my year by wasting it stuck in school doing stuff I didn't want to do so I so my plan was definitely to do to do one year and I did fill out my uh, UCAS form at the time like I got as far as getting um, very nice things said about me by the teacher so I could send that off and, and do another course but for me I was only 17 when I went up I was um, the youngest person at the college and I don't know for some reason um, from my side of it anyway it was the right place for me at the right time it, everything just seemed to make sense and um, the thing I would say about Solmore is the classes are small and the teachers are very very generous with their time and I felt that I got so much help and support and encouragement. I just loved it. And I was also in a wee place, coming from a tiny village who had, you know, it was me and one boy in my class in school, although I went into Oban High um, for, for secondary. So going up to, to Slate, for me, going to another, I guess, sort of rural place didn't seem that different because I came from... Um, a wee place anyway but it was also filled with students which was very exciting at the time because there's lots of different people I didn't know that I got to meet and I just loved I had an absolute ball and then by the end of the year I wasn't really sure if I definitely wanted to go to to university or what exactly I wanted I still quite like the idea of going and doing medicine but um it sounds so funny now but even just being out for that year I was like, well, I'm not really very sure about this. And I felt like maybe I was going to be late, um, which was crazy when I think I was only being sixth year. But I remember somebody saying to me, well, if you're not 100% sure, why don't you do another year? Because again, you'll get another qualification from that. So you'll get a qualification at the end of your first year, get a qualification at the end of your second year, see how you feel after that. So that's what I did. And then at the end of my second year, they were like, Joy! why not do another year? Because then you'll have a degree and you'll still only be 20 and then you can go and do whatever you want, but you've got a degree behind you, which seemed like a very sensible idea. Then at the end of my third year, they went, would you like to do honours? You can go to Canada now and study over there, um, which is what I did and I absolutely loved it. So then I got to the end of my fourth year 
Um, and I had an honours degree and I loved being um, at SOMA. I loved learning about Gaelic and look at the intricacies of the language. And I thought, you know what? It felt like a waste then to go away and um, do something else. And I also thought at that point I was too old to go away and do something else at 21. Um, and now I look back and I think I really wasn't. But actually, um, it was definitely one of these things that I just loved being there. I loved the people that I was with. Um, it was a really kind of mixture. Um, I don't know if you can see anybody there that um, Marissa's holding up a calendar. Um, that was one that I sent back to him when I was in uh, Canada doing my uh, fourth year because Marissa was always in a good kind of cowboy boots. I asked Joy to bring me cowboy boots from Canada and this is what she brought me, a calendar. I was a poor student, I have, you know. Um, <laughs> but it was just, I don't know, I just, I loved it. And um, it, it just clicked for me, right place, right time. And I think if you're, if you are unsure, um, I don't know anybody, genuinely, I'm not being paid to say this, I don't know anybody that's gone, oh, I went to Somo and I really regretted it. It was always everybody's right choice, even if it's only for a year, if it's for longer. Um, and you won't get the experience anywhere else and you won't get people who are genuinely invested in you and helping you like you will at Solmore. Thanks Joy. Um, Can I intervene here to say that this is a very very strange and unfamiliar setting because I've never heard, well I have, but I've never spoken English to Joy or to El Aileen or to Kirsty or to Cassell in my life <laughs> and I think that illustrates some of the points I was making. This is a strange experience and this would be this is what the student would be trying to create in reverse um, so that they would be normalising like speech in the new language with, the, with their fellow students. But it's a strange thing to be. It's not it's strange hearing really, you speak in English, but it's strange to be speaking English. And in fact, I'm going to have to start. Absolutely. But I mean, it's probably worth just clarifying. Like when I went to Solmore, I could talk about my family, my hobbies, where I went on holiday. And I could talk about things in Gal. If you asked me specific questions that I had learnt, if you went off piece, I had no idea what you were talking about. And I couldn't, like, I could say, you know, my name is Joy. I come from Connell. I went to Open High School. I have three brothers. But if you said to me, how do you say I have a car? I couldn't do that because I hadn't learnt that. And really that sort of shift to going into a situation where when we were learning Gaelic in Gaelic, that sounds mad. It sounds like something that is never, ever going to be possible. And it's unbelievable how easily in some ways you get into the swing. Do not get me wrong. There was definitely sometimes I had no idea what was going on. Um, but that was okay. Nobody seemed to mind that. We were all a bit confused sometimes. Or you'd realise that you'd picked up a word completely incorrectly. And I was off on this tangent and people were talking about something totally different. But it was all right. It was all right to make mistakes. It was okay to just like try and say what you had to say. And really, really quickly, you just got very, very used to learning Gaelic in Gaelic. Now, if you'd said that to me in school, that we'd be doing that, I would never have believed you because I was so worried about making mistakes or not being understood or, you know, not having any friends because you couldn't be like, look how fun I am. But you couldn't say that in, in Gaelic yet because you didn't have any of the language skills. But it really, really quickly, I don't know if you found the same, Chiselle, but it, qu it quickly becomes very natural. And Before Chiselle, can I ask Joy, like... I how long did it take before you felt when you were speaking, when you opened your mouth, because you were getting, you know, sort of, it became the norm to, to at least be in Gaelic mode. But when did it become normal when you opened your mouth to speak and it's you who's speaking in the new language? And it's not you in character, as it were, you know? Because for a while when you're learning a language, you're in character. Yeah. Doing little bits of French or whatever the language is. And then one day or at some point you say, well, when I open my mouth and press, and uh, present my personality now, it's me speaking in the new language. That must come at some stage eventually. Yeah, I, I don't think you think about it. Like, I, I do remember getting very excited because I had a dream. And in my dream, I was speaking Gaelic. And I was like, I was speaking Gaelic in my dream. This was huge. But I think it just, it's not that all of a sudden you're like, aha, today I am Gaelic Joy. It's more just that you get so used to doing it that um, it becomes really natural. Like for some reason, my mum was obsessed with the news. And like every time I phoned home, she was like, can you understand the news yet in Gaelic? Turns out news is very hard. And I was hysterical, like nearly so panicky. I was like, I can't understand anything. I cannot understand the news. 
But then I realised, like months later, I was like, I totally understand the news. Back when I stopped panicking about it, I think it's just like anything. It's not there isn't a moment that you're like, I am now fluent. I am now wonderful. But it just, it just you kind of get into the swing of things a wee bit, and it be stops becoming scary, and you start being able to talk to people and learn stuff and check things, and th that's how I found it. I don't know if it was the same for you, though, Chriselle. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I've been friends with Joy now for quite a number of years and we've never spoken about our so more experiences. And I'm pretty gobsmacked at how similar our experiences with learning Gaelic are. Um, I, I was thinking about the dream thing earlier. I remember Monica saying to us one day, oh, you'll know you're fluent when you start having dreams in Gaelic. And I remember, I still remember my first ever Gaelic dream. And it was like, I woke up and I think I phoned everyone, texted the Sobor group chat. I've just had my first Gaelic dream. And it's like, it, it's almost like it just clicks and you think, it just gives you this sort of weird confidence boost um that you're you're getting a grasp of the language and it, for me it's you know I came from Lewis um as I said and I would go home quite often but the minute I got off the ferry in Uig that was me with my Gaelic hat on my soul more hat was on and it was just Gaelic was on my mind constantly then and that's all I really ever spoke and I think the kind of the encouragement um, you get from from not even just your own teachers, every single staff member from the cleaners to the canteen staff, reception, everyone is there to support you. They're there to be your friends. They're not there to kind of belittle you, make you think that you're less than anyone else who's fluent in the language because obviously the Kosher Komish is, you know, the learner course. We're the one, we're meant to be the class that's got the least amount of Gaelic you know, in the whole college. Um, but you're never felt like that. You're never made to be to be felt like that. And for me, it was, I had a really lovely class. It was a small class um, and we were all there to support each other. And we all just kind of had fun learning. And I never really remember finding it overwhelming or anything. You think, oh, how am I gonna suddenly just be able to speak Gaelic every day in a classroom? <clears throat> but then you kind of think about it. Well, I was doing, I was doing that for two hours a day anyway in school and, you know, when I was learning Gaelic and advanced higher. And I think, well, what's a couple more hours a day? What's a couple more hours in the week? You know, we can do this. And it was just you, you, you were never made to feel um, if you made a mistake that you were, you know, you were never being told that's wrong. You know, you, you, you were never made to feel embarrassed by making a mistake. And I think that's how we learn um, as 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 humans, really, in any, in any way, uh, in any walk of life, you make mistakes and that's how you learn. And at so more, that's that's exactly what you've got to do. And for me, speaking Gaelic is all about confidence. And I was told that as a young, young girl going to uh, face Ilana Roy here in Stornoway. And it's a confidence thing. If you sound confident speaking Gaelic and you make a mistake, people won't notice because you said it so confidently. And if you make a mistake, it's fine. Say it with confidence and people will just, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll correct you, they'll help you out. Um, that's just the way kind of learning the language is all about. And like I said, I was kind of wanting to go into media. I didn't really know what I wanted to do in school. I was into maybe teaching. Then I kind of started getting into some politics. Then like my media interest started coming. And if you want something so badly, like I wanted to work in the media so badly, you know, you'll do anything to get there. You'll work your socks off. And for me to get to where I, where I am today and to where I wanted to be, I had to master Gaelic, reading, writing and speaking it. And if it wasn't for Kosher Komish, you know, wouldn't have I been able to do that. And like I said as well, I could have, I could have done this course at home. And I had my interview at home and then my parents were like, well, you've been offered an interview in Sky. Let's let's just go and see what it's like. And I was so dubious because I'm such a home bird. And like Joy said, you know, going from one small place to another is so much less daunting than having to move to like a whole big new city or whatever. Um, so we went all across um, to Sky and um, I'm actually related to Marachuk, which was like really nice. And I'd never, ever met him, though, Um so mum was like, well, it'll be nice, you know, you'll get to meet your cousin and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it was just, you know, from the moment I met Marukha, it was just, you know, everything I was worrying about just went. And we just had the most natural Gaelic conversation that was like out of a school environment. It was like almost like my first grown up Gaelic conversation was with Marukha when I was came down for, you know, to see if this course was right for me. And the minute we got to Solmore, everyone was just so lovely and 
that's when we all, even my parents felt this is just so right. This is this is meant for you. And it was. And I've never looked back. Like Joy said, no one's ever gone to so more and said they regretted it. And if they did, don't believe them. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, it'd be good to talk a bit about the social side as well. Um, Kirsty, you're our only Sky native, I've just realised here. Um, <laughs> and you teach on the course of Komish as well as Murahug. And does it feel like a wee family? You know, it's 20 hours a week, they're all together in that classroom. It must really uh, feel like a family by the end of the year. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the first day they walk in, they're all very awkward and they're kind of looking at each other, trying to form who they're going to be pals with. And at the end, they're all all friends with each other. Last year I started um, with the, my work, the job the same day as the students did and uh, uh, students did with Kursa Komish and just quickly going back to what um, Joy and Cassell were saying about how you come out and you've barely got any Gaelic. Well, you do have Gaelic, but you can, you've got what you've done in school. And on the first day, I remember that there was a, a welcome speech and Murakhi said to me before we went in, the students will probably find this overwhelming as they won't understand a lot of the Gaelic spoken here, but by the end of the year, they will. And I, at the end of the speech, I could see the students' faces. They're all like, oh gosh, I don't understand this at all. Um, I'm feeling a wee bit overwhelmed, as you would naturally on the first day of university. And I remember the last day of Curse of Comish this year, after the full year of, first, um, of teaching, and I could, I was thinking, looking at the students, I was like, they could have all delivered this speech. You know, it's amazing how well they come on in the year. It's, it's fantastic to watch as a, as a, as part, as a teacher. And it's a very rewarding, I can imagine it's a very rewarding experience for them. Um, in terms of social aspect of it, very, very much, I, very much a vibrant community. I'm very much jealous of the, the I hear, the mustangs of their night before in the, in the corridor and in class, very jealous. And it sounds like they're having an absolutely fantastic time. Sky is very vibrant. Um, there's lots going on all the time, whether that's in the North End or whether it's in the South End. And I think the students, I wasn't a sole more student myself, but I do believe that even though even it is a, it is a small community, but they really do make the best of the best of the situation and that they have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Do Cassell and uh, Joy want to add anything to, to that? There was plenty of Kayleys when I was there anyway. Yeah, where do we even start? Um, you know, you think when you're going to, to Sky, you think, oh, there can't be very much going on here. And it's that's where you're just so wrong. I mean, the, you've got the kind of the Kayleys that happen uh, at the college. Um, you've got the Shaul events that happen out with the college, but um, are based, you know, they host them at the college all the time. And there's always music on the go. Uh, there's a couple of pubs locally. And if, if they still do it, they used to certainly uh, EI on a Thursday, the minibus would get put on and you'd off, off to the pub and the music students would just host the most wonderful Kaylee and, um, I wasn't a music student, but I am a musician, so it was always really nice. I got to join in, you know, with them at that kind of thing, and I, I never ever lost my my kind of confidence in playing or being in in bands and that. There was opportunities for doing that. Um, even just travelling around the island, you know, there's so much to do in Sky, and every every nook and cranny, it's there's something new and. Um, it was always fun just jumping in the car, hop, off we went to Portree for the day or up to Staffan and Flodgary and, you know, the fairy pools, there's so much to do. You've got the bridge as well, so you can just hop to Inverness or Glasgow. Um, there, there really is endless things that go on at Solmore. I think uh, now might be a good time to show we've got a promo video um, for anyone who's not seen it. So that might give you a wee blast at the wee taste of of what it's like. Um, my colleague Mick's just going to share that.
Well, I don't know if that makes anyone feel like they want to go back to their student days. <laughs> the place at the moment is like an X-ray version of that. All these trees in, in full bloom and everything. It's like an X-ray drawing of that. It's even nicer, I think. There's no leaves in the trees now. It's all. It's almost like a kind of you know, all these trees with no leaves. I think it's even nicer in the winter. As well as like this week. We've got snow on the hills. My background uh, is really not a true representation, nor Kirsty's. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I think we get a lot of folk asking, "What's the accommodation like? What's what's the canteen like?" And I still, um, when I'm sitting making my own dinner, I still wish that I was having a small canteen dinner <laughs> most nights. Um, don't know if you have any good memories, Joy, of of the accommodation and just yeah. I mean, I ate facilities. and drank my way through through four years at Solmore, let's be honest. Um, it was great. I, and I think I didn't appreciate how lucky we were until I saw where my friends were in Glasgow. Um, I mean, I had a bath. I just keep telling that to everybody. <laughs> I was in a student room that had a bath all to myself and all my meals were made uh, for me. And everybody knows I am a very good eater. It is one of my um, skills and you will never go hungry at Solmore. You're just really well looked after and um, they're good for catering for you. And the rooms are lovely. I mean, there's, it's student accommodation that is used for when visitors come to the college, people stay in them. So, you know, there's a level there that it's got, they've got to be at anyway. Um, so I think that if you've ever seen student accommodation, then you look at some of where you have your own room, you've got your own bathroom, you've got a common room, you've got so many different, I mean, and there are so many more, um, this and even now than there were when I was there you know that that is I mean we did not have a gym it is fair to say the only walking I ever did was between buildings and even then it was that push that was only because none of us had a car you know it, it, there's just so much uh, more now for you so and I think it just takes away that worry you know you never have to worry about um you know feeding yourself um you never have to worry about doing anything your room is cleaned there is a cleaner who oh, cleans no. your room and change your bed and everything i mean we were totally ruined compared to anywhere else so yeah i mean you're you're really lucky and obviously it depends where there's different buildings so you can you have a choice over where you'd like to be and what sort of place and who you'd like to be with and sometimes i went for you know maybe the the more raucous corridors because that was where all my friends were but um yeah, I mean, I don't think you're going to get better, to be fair. We've actually had a, a question in from an attendee, and I think this is actually my fault that this uh, um, that they've got this uh, this opinion. But tap a liver for this awesome info session. Am I right in my observation that there are far more women attending Solnarostig than men? What reflections do you have about this? I think that um, this was my selection of the panel. I, I wasn't very good at ge gender balance, but these BBC uh, <laughs> colleagues here will will know that they, they do a better job than me there. But um, Kirsty and Murahu, you could comment on how your classes are. Well, uh, There's the, a huge mix of people, isn't there? Well, the general answer to that is that, of course, universally, there are uh, in all language programmes, just as a rule across the boards, there are more women than men or males uh, more females and males attending uh, language programs and i think you would find the same kind of thing and maybe the person who wrote that was referring to the video in which it might have looked that way rather than on, on this um profile tonight i think um but it's generally the case and uh, and it may be if you i i um, when we do the stats every year and when you when you do your course reports and so on i always have to report on this every year and um it kind of fits in with the norms that's the first thing you to say about that. In, a, in the case of soul mode, it's, you might say, in a good, uh, there was one year, um, kind of a, a standout year about five years ago, in which it was 50 50 and in Coors of Comish. But that was a bit of a, a, um, a, a blip, really. Uh, normally, it'll be at least two to one uh, in our particular uh, course. And generally across the college, um, two to one uh, female outnumbering male, um, maybe even three to one sometimes. Yeah, so they're somewhere between 65 and 75 percent female. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that's a reflection. I don't think it's a reflection of this college in particular, or of this language in particular, but generally across the boards. I was actually just going to come on to demographics, but someone has has just also asked, could you talk us through the application process? What are the stages? When are the deadlines? Also, what's the general age range of students? I think, yeah, it's important. We've got two folk here, I think, who 
left school and went straight to the course but that's not really the norm is it no. the norm when I was there like I was by far the youngest um as a as a you know as a fifth year leaver I think I was the youngest um everything else we spread I don't know if it's the same for you Chris, but it spread all the way up to you know people who'd retired and were looking for for something to do to people who'd come in taken years out of their degree to folk who had graduated and then wanted to tackle on Gaelic people who'd moved their families up to slate so they could mm -hmm. learn it really was a very parents parents who put children to Gaelic medium education and want to sort of it's a, it's a tough one that but try to keep up with their children learning yeah, um, yeah the woman up in her 70s um in my course uh, we I, I just specifically remember my class being a huge um, age range. I don't even remember that year, Murakh, there was loads um, of mature students um, and maybe like people in their like mid to late twenties who'd already done degrees, had worked. Um, there was like, um, I think what one of the, my classmates was a teacher, uh, but wanted to go into Gaelic teaching. So came to Somo for a year and now she's a Gaelic teacher. Um, and you know, th these things kind of happened quite a lot. So it's not just college leavers, um, school leavers, sorry, at all. There was probably only a handful of them in my year. Um, Generally speaking, yeah, le learning Gaelic resonates with a, 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 a broad church. Um, really, uh, anybody who's, for example, been dabbling as a pastime in learning language, say night classes, and, and not provision isn't hasn't been that great, you know, over the, you know, at council level or at local level or throughout Scotland, and people have been dabbling in it. And uh, they come in, and, and they could be at any stage in life. And very often it's retired people as well. And there's um, people, the career change that Chriselle mentioned, that's a common one too, where somebody's in their mid-20s, they've been maybe doing something for five years in a career, and they, they're they now maybe coming to an age when they say, well, I did that for somebody else, and I'm going to do what I would rather than might go into teaching or something. And mm -hmm. but and, and ge the general um, appeal of the Gaelic language, you, you can't rule out the legacy factor as well, that sort of aspect of where it's, um, it, it, for many of the people who do this, and it's not always... Scottish-based students, but people, uh, a lot, a lot of students in England, for example, and it's almost like a what would you call it, a sort of an heirloom which wasn't passed down, that identity issue thing, where people might have had a grandparent or even a grandparent, and they're they they represent the Gaelic diaspora generally, and it could be anywhere in the world, but for, even in the UK in itself, so you get people kind of connecting almost on a sort of an identity issues with this language, so it's not surprising then that um, these people. Uh, occupy all stages in life when they and it's hard to take the year to, well even it's only eight months I suppose but nine months but it's hard to get that out of work and to get, so it's usually quite a commitment but um, when people eventually do it they end up here on that course and it's uh, school leavers have always always been in the minority and a huge minority and that well I mean a tiny minority a small a chunk unfortunately for the college of the people who've come on this particular course not so the other courses not so, so the fluent speaker stream, which tends to be primarily uh, school leavers who are on their university career, uh, first round, as it were. But uh, most of the, I think I mentioned it in, in my intro, most of the people who have done this course over the years have been, uh, have taken the standalone one year option and um, gone off with that. Uh, for, it's fulfilled, uh, you know, something that I've been thinking about for 10, 20 years. So uh, that, the age range thing is, so can I add as well the age um, I found as well it, whether you've got young students that have just left school or you've got people that have taken career breaks or people that are retirement it almost feels in a sense that the age is irrelevant at Sulmore they very much everyone is one team one big group and you see everyone's mixing with one another it's it's fantastic to see so despite the eight big range of ages I think sometimes maybe in other universities you see maturer students sticking together and younger students sticking together. It's not the case at all. Very much mix. No. Yep. That's interesting. Thanks. And also, uh, Josie was looking to find out about the application process. What are the stages and when are the deadlines? Um, the deadlines, uh, we, we, the admin side, uh, we're, we're not, none of us are involved in admin to that extent, but um, the process in terms of what you the audition, if you like, you know, um, you can have that an interview any time throughout the year, and um, the application directly to the college can be any time throughout the year. And we we sometimes take people up to the week before the course starts. We've never been oversubscribed in the sense that we were never told 
uh, we have 20 places and then the course is closed. The, the course doesn't close. In, in a, the biggest year we ever had, we had 30, for example. Um, and I was told then, well, what happens if we go over 30? And they were told, just, yeah, we'll find, you know, we'll we'll house them and we'll find tutors. So um, there isn't an issue of that kind. Uh, and in terms of when to have your interview or when to, when to make your application, we recommend that you come and speak to us, say, Anytime now, as soon as you start thinking about it and have a sort of a, almost like a kind of a, what do you call it, um, um, bookend kind of interview process where you come and speak to us, say now, and then we say to you, well, your Gaelic is, you know, at the level which, at which you could enter the course next year, even as you are, or more often than not, it's like, you're not there yet, but there's, you know, six, seven months before the course starts again. So here's what to do. And you give you a kind of a development almost regime where you can self-develop. And uh, the sooner you come, the better you find that out, like a diagnostic, almost uh, audition or interview. It's not like an audition in which you go for a job and you don't get the job. It's not that kind of audition. It's a sort of a meeting, meeting one to be followed by a meeting two, several months down the line. And then uh, with, a, with a kind of a guidance as to how to bring your Gaelic on in the meantime. And uh, we'll have you two entering that in the next. So you can come anytime uh, to, to cut the story short. You could. You could uh, have your interview any time in a year. School leavers tend to go through the UCAS university system, and people will be familiar with that in, in any course. Uh, I'm not. I think you you uh, you apply in December, and you get interviews start happening in February, March. That's if you're coming through the school route. But uh, people can apply direct to the college, um, and that could be any time throughout the year. And you could apply as late as I wouldn't advise it, but you could apply as late as the week before the course starts. And um, you know, sometimes it's people take these decisions when they come on the the short summer courses that run for a week and quite often someone's inspired then by the good weather and everything else to um this is it this is going to be the year i'm thinking i'm going to try and do it usually requires more planning than that but most people don't so maybe take a year out of work or whatever it is uh, whatever the, the circumstances are but the, the short answer would be anytime you can have your interview anytime and the sooner the better we would prefer it um and especially if there's a bit of work needed and we tend to think of again in that kind of abstract and holistic sense your kind of course entry starts the day you have the interview and your course starts that day because we put you on a sort of program say well do this do that and, and get a language buddy and try and put some Gaelic and you know miles in your legs as it were uh, put some Gaelic in the tank and then come and speak to me again in x month's time and if you see evidence of progress the person themselves and you uh, the college is then satisfied that this person is incrementally progressing. So that's the signs that you need that they will make a success of the course. Uh, if you see someone who would like to come on the course and then speak to them a few months later and you don't hear any difference, they and you are finding out maybe it's important to the person themselves. They find out maybe they don't have the engine to do it and it's the best time to find that out. So the interview process is kind of a long, it's a sort of a, what would you call it? It's a sort of, um, it's tailored to the individual, really. I mean, it depends what your circumstances are when you come. And there's no there's no um, expiry date and there's no date by which you have to apply or any of that. Mm -hmm. But you might expect maybe in a bigger or in a busier or in a more um, competitive. I mean, this course has never been oversubscribed, put it that way. Um, yeah, just a note, if you were to apply via UCAS, there's various deadlines and there's intakes throughout the year the first of which I, I believe closes on the 25th of January, 2023. Um, if you're to apply direct with us, the email address is eratus at smo.uhi.ac.uk and we'll send all these this information out after, after this event. Um, Generally, yeah. anybody applying through UCAS will already be aware of the, probably the UCAS. If they're coming through schools, they'll be aware of the UCAS timetable anyway, yeah. possibly. And we have Kisht Canada. Canada, de Hotterev, no first at the Gunu Sahasho, Chien Vogui Hila, Mark Canada. And a lucky flicker to Sagalic. Hanyaksha, Hanyel and Yaksha Tolhina, the Kursh of Homish, British of Tolka Kursh, the Kursh of Connolly. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll say that, that's not, that and that, not intended to be a flippant answer either. Um, Anybody who can write Gaelic as well as that in, a, in an email is will will certainly interview you, and you'll probably get onto the other course, which is for the fluent speakers, as it were. But um, no problems. We have we usually have someone almost every year from Canada or from the US. Um, we've got 
one US student this year, is it? Nobody from Canada. We had one from the US last year, two from two from the US uh, the year before. Uh, Canada, down through the years. Um, how difficult it is. It's difficult, the visa side of it, and getting out of your own country and into this one is the tricky bit. And the sooner that those applications are made, I'm not sure about Canada, the US is tough. Um, so from, from that, the admin side of it, of getting out of the US and into Britain, into the UK, is uh, that's where the that's where the holdup would be. Admin staff at Solmore are very, very welcoming, very helpful if you have any questions as well. And um, we have another question. I'm thinking about joining the course straight from Ankursa Intiki, finishing in June. Is this realistic in terms of the level of language as well as the timing? Um, and Kursi Intiki, for those who don't know, is our online um, distance learning um, course that's similar to this course. Well, um, well, I handle that one as well, since I've <laughs> got that hat on sometimes as well, the Kursi Intiki hat. Um, I would assume that the, the person asking this will be uh, your you, best to try to get to the end of uh, part of three, year on the three of Kursi Intiki, which is the third semester, third part of the, the, the Kursi Intiki um, three-part course and it's an access course to this very course you could say it wasn't quite written um not quite written to um to be an access course to this course but it was a, an access to this level the level the threshold level of this course in fact as as uh, the student may know um if you were to stay on, on the online mode you would do encourage artists perhaps from encourage intrigue which is uh, in legal or technical terms, the equivalent online of the course of Comish, this course that we're talking about tonight, it has its sort of sister course online, which is in course artist two years rather than one and uh, part time, uh, one class a week rather than 20 and so on. But um, the same sort of syllabus, if you like, and the same language competencies uh, at the end of the uh, of the day. And a lot of people stay online and do in course artist. But that's just to illustrate the fact that in Kursi Indriki and in Kursi Komish are beautifully lined, aligned. Um, the Kursi Komish started in 97, 98 was its first year. And the Kursi Indriki was written, we started writing that in 99, 2000. So we already had the notion of the threshold level of Kursi Komish to aim at with Kursi Indriki when we started writing it. So they're practically tailor-made for each other. But I would advise whoever it is that they get to, because sometimes... Um, Depending on the course of Indrigi stream that you're on, you might be on the, if you start in September, you'll get to the end of Yara Naga, part two. And it's it's a risky thing to jump from that to Nkursa uh, Komash. There's a gap of, yeah, the, the bit that you haven't done would be the following semester. But there's a, we, we've developed in the last, in fact, we piloted it this year successfully. Some people have got to the end of Yaring two in the summer and would like to have come rather than wait another year to, get to the entry level, they did a sort of a um, um, condensed version of Nkush of level three online. It was an experiment, a, a pilot went really well and uh, produced two or three, um, no, in fact, half a dozen uh, applicants who, as it happened, went to the Kush Artish, the online version, but they would have had to wait another year to get to that level. In fact, they got in a year earlier having done that. So we, we were definitely working with the notion of, even if you're on part two, of Nkurs Eindriki, that you could do part three in another format in the summer, either attending Solmoor for a two-week short course or a three-week online. It was a three-week online we did this year. So I don't know, I've answered too many questions there that weren't asked, but um, the short answer again, too late. Um, they've said, we'll be finishing part three, so that's encouraging. To that's perfect. Yeah, that's, you'd be, uh, and, you know, obviously the, the unknown factor and the, the variable is of course, you know, how well you've, you know, the course is the course and how, how well you've, how successful you've been in the journey. Yeah. And so you'd have your interview like anybody else, your audition, but it's a great, if you've done well in the course and if the course has done well for you and if it's been a suited your learning style and whatever, and if you found it a good and satisfying course, uh, and it's particularly with the conversational uh, methodology of Nkursi Intriki, it's tailor-made really for entry to Nkursa Komas. Um, and if not, you've still got six months, so get more speaking in your in your phone class and do even more of it and get your conversational side up. It's the ability to be uh, extempore in speech, to, to produce speech unrehearsed in the moment and to be in the moment and to, 
as a thought arises, transmitted in speech. That's the skill above all the skills that that prepares you and makes you. What I used the word match fit earlier on for um, the crucial coma is that that it's not an unfamiliar act to you to converse in speech in the language you're learning. For us, we all know that um, quite often language programs are less ambitious than that in the school sector and so on. Um, and that's not to do with teachers, it's to do with maybe the SQA and its benchmarks and its, what you call it, its criteria. But uh, speech tends to be the least developed of all the uh, language skills, whereas it's the one you most need to develop to get onto this course. Mm -hmm. And um, Joy, I'm right in thinking that you also teach on some of our online courses, as well as wearing many other hats, presenting the weather on the BBC and various other things, if you don't already recognise Joy. But um, which courses that you teach on, Joy? I've done both the course at ENTV and the course at Irish and they're, they're excellent courses. They feed in really well. So if you're doing that, you'll easily slip in. Great. And we just have one question from YouTube. Does Soma Rostic have an option for spending two weeks to a month during the summer in an immersion environment? And is there an option to find work there on Sky to pay the way through? We have our short courses um, that run throughout the summer um, at various levels from Gaelic 1 to 10. And there are, as Cassell mentioned, there's plenty pubs and restaurants, hospitality. Yeah, no, they, they work on, some of them work either at Fastmore or they'll work at evenings in the bar or they'll pick up some shifts doing cleaning. The students are frequently working at the college. There's lots of opportunities also at the college. For work. And to answer the first part of that, um, uh, in, in the course's history, in recent years, about, it's not, maybe five years ago, maybe between five and 10 years ago, I can't remember which year, one student, it did its first ever um, short course in March, an Easter programme, there's a two week programme in March. And then he came on, did six weeks in the summer and scraped over the threshold level uh, on the strength of that. So it, it has happened in the history of the course, the, the, the proposition that was you know, posed there, it has happened once uh, that a student has done, uh, it costs a lot of money to do six weeks solid of short courses, you can imagine, and to and to, accommodate to have accommodation for those six weeks too but somebody did do it one time and they did get onto the course just to maybe click in from the learner's point um, it's worth checking is are they immersion courses because i know that a lot of the solo short courses aren't they're not no. taught in an immersion fashion but um solo are unbelievably helpful so if you do have any questions just ask that um particular thing if you're looking for the immersion side of it that's quite different to how maybe some of the courses are, are taught. It's just maybe worth having a wee, a wee check about that. But they're very helpful, so don't be afraid to ask. But if it were to stimulate a person's own proactive instinct to whatever is in the course and whatever whether it's being taught primarily through English or through Gaelic, if they can sort of be encourage themselves and inspire themselves to do as much as they can in the Absolutely. after hours and so on. And depends very much. The variable, again, is the person and their own what would you call it, their own uh, enthusiasm or their own uh, drive. Um, if you're determined to do that, you probably will. Uh, la language speaking is only a practical skill after all, and like um, swimming or uh, running, or uh, you start doing it and you'll get better at it as you do it. That's the good thing about it, I suppose, with like being glib, it's up to you, kind of. You know, it's it's you, you control it. You control your own progress to a large extent. Like any physical um, discipline. That's where it differs maybe from an academic, purely academic uh, topic. Great. Um, I think if there's no other further questions, does anyone have anything else they'd like to add? Um, there's, all, there's the option to, to send us an email afterwards and I'll send information out to all attendees um, relating to the course and how to apply. Um, we also have a couple of other sessions on over the next weeks and months um, for our other courses. Um, the sister course to in Course of Comish is Gaelic as Connell through for folk who are at a slightly more fluent um, level. Uh, that's on next uh, Tuesday, the 13th of December. Tim Armstrong, the leader of the course, will be talking us through that um, at the same time between 7 and 8 p.m. UK time and um, on Wednesday we have Gwen uh, Macquarie who's going to be giving us a 
telling us all about the postgraduate diploma in education. So that's anyone who already has a degree and would like to do um, one year um, studying to become a Gaelic teacher for both primary and um, a session with Katrina Johnson, who runs our diploma in Gaelic media, which Cassell mentioned she went on to do after in Pursa Comish. And we also run uh, the uh, BA in Gaelic and traditional Scottish music. And Decker Forrest runs that course. He'll be doing a, a talk on that in the new year as well. We have one other question that's come through. What a compelling time this has been, Tafalov, with love from Shalon Nuog. Hello, Lillian. That's Lillian. Um, <laughs> Great. Kia ni le tain go hot in ye. Um, ah, he shin shiv stoche. I can tell. Na hik shiv haun. I guess tain go gulag ina final joy. Kusel a bruchi. I guess Kirsty. Kia tain. Cheers, Andraste. Lama gave.